We have just finished a long discussion about the energy that is generated during the oxidation of organic compounds, namely carbohydrates. But where do these organic compounds ultimately come from? They are synthesized by autotrophic organisms during the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is essentially the opposite of cellular respiration in that, during the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide, water, and energy from the sun react to produce glucose and oxygen in the overall equation 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus light energy yields C6H12O6 plus 6O2. Photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplasts of plants and in the cell membranes of prokaryotes and consists of two types of reactions, the light reactions and the dark reactions. In the light reactions, Electrons get passed down an electron transport chain, eventually generating ATP through chemiosmosis. Similarly to the electron transport chain in cellular respiration, the energy from the electrons flowing down the chain in photosynthesis causes hydrogen ions to be pumped across the membrane. When they flow back through the ATP synthase, ADP is phosphorylated to become ATP. The creation of ATP during photosynthesis is called photophosphorylation. There are two different types of light reactions, cyclic photophosphorylation and non-cyclic photophosphorylation. In cyclic photophosphorylation, sunlight provides the energy to excite some electrons from chlorophyll which flow down the electron transport chain. These electrons eventually return to the chlorophyll to be re-excited by more sunlight. ATP is the only product in cyclic photophosphorylation. In non-cyclic photophosphorylation, sunlight provides the energy to split water to ultimately provide electrons to the chain. Because water is split, oxygen is a byproduct of non-cyclic photophosphorylation, as well as NADPH, as the hydrogens from the water molecules reduce NADP+. In the dark reactions, also known as the Calvin-Benson cycle, carbon dioxide gets reduced to form glucose as ATP is broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate, and NADPH is oxidized to NADP+. No light is required for this process to occur, but the ATP and the NADP+, that were made in the light-dependent reactions, are consumed during the Calvin cycle. At this point, you should pause the video and watch the photosynthesis animation on microbiologyplace.com. Let's look at a summary of the energy production we have discussed in the last few lectures. In order for an organism to produce energy to sustain life, there must be some initial input of energy in the form of an electron or hydrogen donor. These energy sources can either be the the sun in conjunction with chlorophyll, or another molecule that will donate electrons, such as glucose. The electrons that come from the electron donors reduce electron carrier molecules such as NADP+, NAD+, and FAD. As the electron carriers are being reduced in the light reactions of photosynthesis, or the Krebs cycle in cellular respiration, some ATP is generated. The electron carrier molecules drop off the electrons on the electron transport chain to eventually be accepted by a final electron acceptor such as oxygen in aerobic respiration, nitrates, sulfates, and carbonates in anaerobic respiration, and organic compounds in fermentation. The process of the electrons flowing down the electron transport chain generates even more energy in the form of ATP. This next slide shows how we can use the answers to two simple questions to classify organisms into one of four basic groups. Chemoheterotrophs, chemoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, or photoautotrophs. The first question is, how does the organism get its energy? The organism either gets its energy from an external chemical source, like ingesting food, making it a chemotroph, or it makes its own energy using light from the sun, making it a phototroph. The second question is, what is the carbon source? Or in other words, 
Where does the organism get the monomers that it will assemble into polymers, such as muscle proteins or peptidoglycan? The organism either gets the monomers from somewhere else by ingesting organic compounds, making it a heterotroph, or it makes the monomers itself from carbon dioxide, making it an autotroph. Humans and other animals get their energy from other sources and they get their monomers elsewhere too, namely from organic molecules, making them chemoheterotrophs. At the opposite end of the spectrum are plants, which make their own energy using sunlight and they assemble their own monomers from inorganic molecules, making them photoautotrophs. There are two categories of organisms in between these two extremes. Chemoautotrophs get their energy from other sources, but they are able to assemble their own monomers. Photoheterotrophs make their own energy from sunlight, but they need to get their monomers elsewhere. The last big topic left to discuss in the metabolism lecture series is where the other biomolecules dump into the metabolic processes. Let's review the role of glucose in the process. Glucose, a 6-carbon molecule, gets broken down into pyruvic acid, a 3-carbon molecule, during glycolysis. Pyruvic acid is decarboxylated to become acetyl-CoA, a 2-carbon molecule, and enters the Krebs cycle, where it is further oxidized to carbon dioxide. The NADH and FADH2 that are produced during the Krebs cycle supply electrons for the electron transport chain, which ultimately generates a great deal of ATP. What happens if, instead of starting with glucose, a monosaccharide, we begin the process with disaccharides or even polysaccharides? The polysaccharides get broken down into other sugars, which get broken down and ultimately converted into glucose, which enters glycolysis. Let's look at some lab tests that are related to the ways in which complex carbohydrates function as a part of the metabolic process. Maltose and lactose are both disaccharides. If a bug can digest maltose or lactose, it breaks the bond holding the monomers together and will turn the phenol red indicator yellow as a result of the fermentation occurring in the tube. Litmus milk contains lactose or milk sugar. If the organism can use the lactose to undergo fermentation, a pink color may develop initially as a result of the acidic byproducts of the fermentation process that would turn the litmus indicator pink. Starch is a polymer of glucose molecules. If an organism can digest starch, clear zones will appear around the bacteria when the plate is flooded with iodine. Hopefully, it is clear now, from all the information covered in the past few weeks, how glucose is a major player in the metabolic process. But where do the other macromolecules we eat, such as fats and proteins, dump into the metabolic cycle? Fats, or lipids, get broken down into glycerol, which is a 3-carbon molecule, and fatty acids, which are further broken down into 2-carbon molecules. Glycerol dumps in at the same place as pyruvate, as both contain three carbons. Hydrolyzed fatty acids dump in at the same place as acetyl-CoA, as both contain two carbons. We didn't do any tests in the lab to examine whether your unknown bacteria can metabolize fats. Proteins get broken down into amino acids, which can enter the metabolic cycle in one of two places depending on their structure. The amino acids can enter where pyruvic acid enters or where acetyl-CoA enters. We did complete some lab tests to determine whether or not an organism is capable of metabolizing proteins to use them as energy sources. The nutrient gelatin test allowed us to see if an organism produced gelatinase, an enzyme that breaks down the protein gelatin. If the organism did produce gelatinase, it would have liquefied the gelatin in the test tube. If it didn't produce gelatinase, the gelatin in the tube would have remained solid. The casein plate allowed us to see if an organism could digest casein. If it could, there were clear zones on the casein plate in the areas surrounding the growing bacteria. 
The ability of an organism to digest casein could also be seen from the litmus milk if a curd formed in the bottom of the tube and decreased in size over time, or if the indicator turned purple or blue, indicating that the medium was basic as a result of the digestion of the protein and the subsequent release of ammonia. The indole part of the sim tube indicates whether a bacteria is able to metabolize the amino acid tryptophan. If it can, it produces indole as a byproduct of the breakdown of tryptophan. The presence of indole is indicated by the formation of a red band when the indole detection reagent is added to the tube.